Hi, this is the this is no. Veterans Commission meeting of Wednesday, June 9th at 6 p.m. Uh, reported uh, according to Governor's Executive Order 7B uh, with Chairperson Doug Shipman. Great. Uh, thank you, Mary. And uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, just to reaffirm what we talked about, we uh, before the meeting, we have um, uh, four commission members present, uh, myself, Helen, Frank, and Jennifer, uh, and alternate Sandra Rhodes. So Sandra is a voting, is seated as a voting member for the commission tonight. And um, just wanted to remind people that tonight's meeting and perhaps all future meetings, we reserve the right to go beyond seven o'clock. So we booked until 7.30 in case we need the time. We found that in past meetings, we uh, kind of prescribed uh, our conversations because of a uh, kind of an artificial seven o'clock end time. So uh, not that we expect we need all that time. Um, and a reminder, there is no Memorial Day parade after this tonight, so uh, don't need to, to do that. Um, the next item on our agenda is public comments. We actually, I don't think we have any members of the public, so we'll dispense with that. And oh, wait a minute. Celia, Celia is oh. raising Yep, Celia, would you like to make a comment? Sorry, you're uh, also town staff. I don't so. think I'm supposed. Um, Brooke said, I'm not really here officially. She just wants to keep a sense of what's going on with you guys because we're all interested and we'd like to see how we can help if we can help. But officially, as far as uh, I'm here officially representing the library, I am not. So, so I, oh, think okay. I'm, Very good. I think I'm always to be considered just a drop in visitor and uh, with, with some other interests, strong interests. How's that? <laughs> But I, do we are have, I do have a question, actually, as a member of the public and also as a town staff member. Um, when I mentioned to my staff that I, I had to leave early today so I could then work this meeting, and um, one of my staffers has a husband who is a veteran who uh, she asked me to ask a question for her, and she wants me to find out not necessarily the answer, but who would she go to in this group? to ask this question. Um, her husband needs to, has misplaced his DD-214 military discharge papers. Who would he go to to help him figure out how to get a copy of that? Yeah, Chris Chris Taylor can help you with that uh, anytime okay. offline. She has a process for helping veterans find their DD-214, okay. which is their record of service. Great question, because I'm sure a lot of veterans have that. So. Uh, Celia, thank you. Anything else, Celia? Oh, okay, good enough. Um, we're going to move on to the minutes, and uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to look at the minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of the May 12th, 2021 meeting? Frank Both is moving to adopt the minutes. Uh, I, make, I make a motion to adopt the minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Just raise your hand. Thank you, Jennifer. All righty. Uh, any discussion or corrections to the minutes? Was that enough wait time? All you classroom teachers, I know about wait time. Okay, so good. Hearing none, uh, all in favor of adopting the minutes, please signify by raising your hand. Yeah, that was a trick question, raising your hand. Okay, very good. Keep it up there so we can count. Can't count if your hand's back down again. One, two, three, four. And uh, I think we're good. So uh, thank you. <laughs> the uh, minutes uh, are approved. Any letters and announcements? Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. Um, it's Chris, I have a couple of emails that I forwarded to the Veterans Commission. And I wanted to say one is um, there's two um, activities coming up tomorrow. Yeah, one is the Connecticut DVA Virtual Town Hall Veterans Readiness and Employment, and this is to the federal VA, and that is Thursday, June the 10th at 4 p.m. So I think I I think I have gotten everyone um, 
an email on that, how you can register and uh, participate in that if you'd like. And then the second event, we've been invited, the veterans have been invited here to a grand opening again on Thursday. Another event here happening tomorrow, Thursday, June the 10th at 10 a.m. Uh, there's an Eastern Connecticut Veterans Community Center that's brand new and opening up on 1320 Main Street, Suite 27 in Romantic, Connecticut. And, you know, I had called um, Diane Nadeau, who's the president and C CEO of the Wyndham Regional or Region Chamber of Commerce, and she says this is open to all veterans. So if anyone's interested, the invitation is, is for you to attend. And, Chris, thank, uh, you. thank you. And I had one more final thing here, which came on June 3rd, which is the letter that came from the um, state VA regarding the, I'm sorry, the federal VA regarding the um, co-payments that veterans make and deadlines and everything else as far as how it affected uh, the co-payments during COVID. So if anybody's interested, that email will forward it to you. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Chris, you're always so good at sending that out to everybody, and it's much appreciated. And uh, I know some Thank people you. probably know about those things already from their jobs, but many of us don't. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very helpful. Um, Thank you. Any other letters or announcements before we move on to the action items? No? Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, we wanted to kind of move through the, the perfunctory parts of our agenda as quickly as possible out of respect for the many guests that have joined us and uh, really appreciate the time. Uh, Ken Lesser with the Board of Education and, and Sally DeSoli, Assistant Superintendent, uh, and, and all of the rest of the crew that are here. And maybe before we get into uh, the topic, would, would you all like to just introduce yourselves uh, one at a time so we can know who everybody is. Great, Doug. Well, I'll uh, start us off. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I have to tell you that I've worked in Weathersfield for a long time, and it's so nice that I've heard many of your names or seen your names, and to put a face to your name is, is, is really nice, even though I know it's a virtual face. Um, so thank you for the invite, and uh, we're honored to be here to have a conversation with you. Um, and, uh, you know, during this process, hearing more about the work and the important work you do for the community of Weathersfield has really been um, important to also hear. So thank you for everything you're doing on, on your end. Um, so I am Sally Stoli, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. And um, I'm incredibly lucky to have um, a fellow administrator and two incredibly talented high school teachers here. So um, Diane Adamson, um, if you want to go ahead, I'll let you introduce yourself and your role, Diane, because you'll do a far better job talking about yourself than I will. Yeah, I, I feel um, old, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, currently, I have the most years in in the social studies department. Um, and probably, well, Joe Kess is retiring, so maybe I have the second most years in after Rich Scapetto. Um, but yeah, I've been a member of the social studies department um, since the uh, fall of 1986, where I did my student teaching. Um, the guys that I student taught with ended up leaving by the end of the year, so I did a long-term sub, and I have never left Weathersfield High School since. Um, so that's really kind of where my perspective is. I've kind of seen a lot of things come and go. Okay, thank you, Diane. Courtney Bradley. Oh, you're still on mute, Courtney. There we go. Um, so hi, I'm Courtney. Um, I've been teaching in Weathersfield for 25 years. Um, the only school district that ever taught in, although I started teaching elementary school for the first 10 over at Highcrest, and then I finally managed to get into the history department at uh, Weathersfield High. Um, I have a degree in, in leadership. I have a degree in history from Central. Um, Central did my bachelor's of science as well. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talk about uh, how we're going to deal with history. Great. Thank you, Courtney. And John Kazar. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, 
I, I will have to point out, Sally, that you pointed out the two talented teachers and just the fellow administrator, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, uh, but really, it's an honor to be here and talk a little about, um, you know, some of the concerns I have, um, especially um, as the director of special services, uh, really making sure I advocate for um, uh, our students with disabilities to make sure that we really, uh, uh, you know, provide the appropriate programs and education for them. So thank you for having me here. John, you'll always have a special, special place in my heart. Well, thank you all. And um, just to maybe preface this conversation, I know Sally, probably you and, and Kenny Lesser have talked a little bit. We, we had uh, a, actually a member of the high school staff, um, a, a good friend of ours, John Sand, came uh, several months ago with a concern um, that the uh, US history requirement was about to be dropped from the, uh, or had, had been dropped from future graduating class requirements and felt that was uh, a concern that the Veterans Commission should be aware of and, and may want to voice an opinion on or, or what have you. Um, we spoke last month uh, with Kenny, who uh, I will say, even though he's only been on the Board of Ed for a short time, represented you all extremely well uh, and explained the, uh, the rationale for the current uh, situation, as well as some of the exemptions that uh, exist for, for students. And, and he offered that you all might be interested in coming just to explain further um, uh, what the requirements are for graduation. So at this point, we're just interested in learning as much as we can about what the current situation is and what the change will be uh, for uh, future graduating classes. And, and uh, to be completely candid, we have to figure out if there's anything that we can or should attempt to do uh, to address the concerns brought to us by John Sands. Uh, so uh, having said that, I'd uh, like to turn it over to you if there's anything you all would like to say and we'd love to hear it. Great, thank you, Doug. So I wanna share just a few introductory um, remarks and, and ideas. I'm gonna um, turn it over to our high school teachers and John to share a few more stories, examples of the complexities around graduation for our roughly 250 to 300 students that graduate from Wethersfield High School each year, and the incredible diversity, talents, um, and differences um, from our, within our student body um, across all, all different ways. Um, and I think that's an amazing thing about Wethersfield, um, Wethersfield Public Schools and Wethersfield High School is the great diversity we have in our student body. Um, from students that come from another country just learning how to speak English in 10th grade uh, to students that are, you know, fifth generation Wethersfield to students that um, come from very affluent households to lower socioeconomic um, students with disabilities, um, you know, and, and every different story, background, family structure, um, the amazing diversity in Wethersfield um, really makes us who we are. And um, a little bit about our graduation policy and how we consider building policies within Wethersfield to help meet the needs and support our students through that diversity and their experiences. Um, similar to our own kind of history um, of when we went to school, but also recognizing that the generation, um, each generation and each, each decade, um, and Diane, I'm, I don't have as many years as you, but I'm, I feel like I'm catching up to you, um, brings us different challenges and different profiles within our student body. And I would just add on as a result of this pandemic has also had a great impact on our student body as far as mental health needs, um, and the support our students um, and adults need as a result of this pandemic as we continue to work through this incredible um, shared stressor for all of us. So um, our graduation uh, policies are, are always changing. Um, I've been back um, uh, to Weathersfield as an administrator for 11 years now, and I think we've made three changes to our graduation policy, um, always following state guidance and requirements because we need to be aligned with the state. Um, so currently we have 25 credits for graduation, which is an increase from 11 years ago. Um, and one of the things that really governs our current graduation uh, policy is really this idea about flexible opportunities um, and allowing students to select um, flexibility within their schedule to pursue their passions, but understanding there's a core knowledge and skills that all students, all of our graduates need to have. And please know that we believe that US history is clearly one of those core, you know, the, the English, the US history, civics, um, 
sciences, the arts, you know, those are core areas that we want all our students to be able to explore. So um, am I able to project my screen, uh, Mary, if I could just project the policy? I just want to show one thing if that's possible. Yeah, I'm good. Go to world yeah. and uh, if it doesn't work, I'll try something else. Not yet. Not, do you know how to do it, Sally, with uh, Zoom? Because it's the share screen button. Yeah, the, the host has to give me permission first. Or I could actually send it to you, Mary, if you want. Is that easier? I just did I, this with somebody the other way, and I'm just looking for where exactly in. You, you take your time. I'm going to keep talking, and then I'll do a visual. You let me know. I, 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 I run Zoom meetings about once a month, and I know what you mean. You have to go back and find out where it is in the settings. Advanced so one, right of, now, one of the okay. things I wanted to show you visually about our graduation policy is that um, you're correct, it has changed um, in the few years. Um, and it changed based upon the guidance from the state around greater flexibility and student choice. So one of the things that you'll see visually when I show you our policy is we used to require um, life science, physical science, earth science. We used to require algebra one, geometry, algebra two, um, yeah, international studies, US history and civics. And so what, ha what would happen in the past is 75% of a student's schedule was uh, concrete and they'd only have choice to pursue their passions and their interests um, for maybe 20 to 25% of their schedule. Other than that, they wouldn't have that choice to be able to pursue their interests. So if we had a student that wanted to go into engineering, they might only be taking four um, STEM classes related to uh, you know, science or engineering. Um, they may be able to take eight. Again, I'm, I'm making up the numbers, but allows them to have some more flexibility around their passions. Um, oh, I'm good, Mary. Give me one minute here. Sorry, I just have to click on the right, right thing to share. So this is our, um, can everybody see the screen? Okay, so this is just a visual um, kind of, and an, this is on our, our website um, that can be easily accessible. But um, so this is a previous policy, as you can see, um, American history, international studies, uh, civics, and American government, um, fine arts, you have algebra, geometry, algebra two, and you have a lot of um, requirements for students. Visually, you can see that they have um, um, recommended to districts that there's a greater kind of flexibility under these different categories, um, allowing students to have different choices. So one of the things I wanna talk about is the difference between a required course and a course that all students take because they are going to uh, be scheduled into that class. So, um, you know, we still strive to have all students take um, Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, because that's really important. Um, but we don't have those listed as a requirement, but we really schedule students into that course sequence. Um, same thing with U.S. History. We are moving U.S. History to a sophomore year class to ensure that all our students will be scheduled into U.S. History. Um, so U.S. History is something that we value and have made those changes to ensure that all students take it. The difference would be around whether they, um, you know, there may be some 2% of our population that have some extenuating learning circumstances, home circumstances, and we'll talk a little more about some of those examples um, that may um, prevent them from um, passing US history and or um, taking it if they're a transfer student in. Um, and again, we'll get into those kind of those exceptions to the rule, um, but as a scheduling perspective, we schedule students into ninth grade English. They all take ninth grade English. They're gonna be all scheduled into US history. They'll all take US history. But we wanna make sure that we can provide um, scheduling opportunities for students uh, versus that requirement for them having to pass a course um, and possibly have to retake a course uh, multiple times in order to make it a graduation requirement. 
So that's a little bit about the policy design based upon the State Department of Education's recommendations. Um, I want to turn it over to Diane and Courtney to talk about um, U.S. history, its importance, and how it translates to other classes, um, and how it's beyond just one one course, and how we also emphasize it and connect to it in other courses. All right, Courtney, if you don't mind, I'll start, and then um, Courtney has been teaching U.S. history, um, and and teaches currently the AP slash ECE, which is um early college experience so it's kind of an upper level course for um our history students so she can speak probably a little better to um what they do in history um so like i said i came here in in 1986 and i student taught with two different teachers one was u.s history so i taught u.s history and one was uh psychology and so i did a couple psychology courses as well well, the teacher who left and I ended up taking their position was the psychology teacher. So I have not taught history um, since the fall of 1986. But history is the foundation of everything we do. Uh, and being in the social studies part of the social studies history department, um, I, you don't escape it. Um, and, and you refer to it and you use it. Um, one of the courses I teach is economics. And so, you know, we'll do the philosophy of economics, which Adam Smith, 1776, and and classical economics. And then when we get to um, the part where we're talking about government intervention, we have to talk about John Maynard Keynes and, and the Great Depression and how, you know, he advocated for government uh, interference into the economy to get it going. And and the New Deal, and the kids will be able to talk about, well, was it the New Deal that really got us out of the Depression? Was it the start of World War II? And, and so history is a part of everything that we do. Um, the English department, history is a part of everything that they do. We do try to work together and coordinate our uh, curriculum so that when the kids are doing particular topics in history, uh, on the English side, they're reading um, books. They're doing either fiction, nonfiction. Like I know for when they do Vietnam, the English department is reading the things they carry. Um, so they'll do some nonfiction. So our two departments, you know, kind of rely on history. I have gone in, um, not for a history necessarily, but kind of the history of psychology when the English teachers are teaching um, Shakespeare and how so much of Shakespeare is Freudian. So I'll go in and talk a little bit about Freud. So the two departments really are, are linked together and we use history all the time. Um, civics, I teach civics currently to our seniors and that's another history course really. Um, we, you know, we start with the whole history of our government. Uh, we read word for word what's in that constitution. Um, then we start to apply it to things that we're seeing today. So I, for one, am, am very, very happy to see U.S. history move down to the 10th grade for the exact reasons that Sally was talking about, which is to give kids uh, room to explore, you know, maybe some specific topics. So they've had their international studies history. They'll have their U.S. history studies. We can then present them other topics. I would love to see an AP uh, government class, which would be in place of the half, the, the semester course of civics. I think some of our kids are extremely interested in, in government and would love to know more. And I think that would be a course that once we get to the sequencing and get to where um, we're set and everybody has, um, we've moved to the freshman international studies and we've moved the US to a uh, sophomore year that allows us two years um, to do other things and to introduce other topics. Um, I did speak to Cindy Bryan, who is our counseling liaison, and just to you know pick her brain about what happens when. Okay, so what happens when a kid doesn't pass history? And she kept using the phrase, we always tell them to keep the door open. 
so many of our students, and I don't have the statistics, my guess is somewhere north of 85%, they're going to college. And so the counselors will always talk to them. Keep your door open. You know, don't, if you say you're not going to college and so you don't need history, keep that door open because you don't know what you're going to decide the year after you get out of here. And so they're always advocating um, for these kids to take what they know colleges are going to require. Um, we have one year required for, for language. All of our kids take three years. Why? because the counselors will say to them, you need three years to go to college. So I wouldn't really be, I'm not really concerned about a kid not passing history because Cindy says we're putting them right back in it because they need to have it for college. Um, so then I asked her, well, what about the kid who comes in as a freshman or comes in as a sophomore speaking no English? And what, what are we gonna do then? Are we going to present history to them at that point? And she said, you know, maybe not as a sophomore. You know, maybe we allow their English skills to get a little better. And then maybe as a junior, we put that in there for the same reasons. We can't close the door on their opportunities after high school. And if there's any chance that they would like to pursue um, education after high school, you know, history is going to be one of those courses that they're going to have to take. Um, you know, John can probably speak a little bit better to some of the special needs kids. Um, I've had some of the special needs kids in, in civics and, you know, we change, you know, we might change some of the, um, some of the assignments a little bit for them. Um, for example, I gave one of my students who she loves to sing, um, while we were doing something that I think she wouldn't have been cognitively ready for. I said, why don't you kind of do a little history of the Star Spangled Banner? Why don't you take a look at our national anthem? And then I said, as a way to, you know, after you give you a presentation about how the Star Spangled Banner came to be, you can sing it for us. Oh my God. It was like she was on um, America's Got Talent. So, um, you know, we have our ways of, of trying to deal with all of the groups of kids that we have. Um, but like I said, Cindy keeps saying to me, and those words keep coming in, we don't want them to close doors. Um, history is going to be a very, very important part of that. Um, we're moving it down to the sophomore year, like I said, and uh, I'm so in favor of that so that we can allow, we can do other things. Um, we have a new course coming up, which is a pilot program for the state, which is, I'm not going to know the entire name because it's very long, but it's African-American and Latinx studies. Um, right now it's a pilot program that uh, Doris Duggins is going to be teaching. So those seniors will look at history after having U.S. history from a, a, maybe a little bit different perspective. So that part of it, I'm very excited for. So I'm going to toss it over to Courtney because she can speak to what she teaches and some of the ideas for some of these other courses that we would have more flexibility in offering once we get to our sequencing. Okay, so um, I teach um, AP and ECE history now, which is a uh, UConn class. Um, kids get credit, they get six credits for about $200. Um, all of my students, there are almost 60 of them, um, are passing and passing with C or better. So they're, and, and they're not necessarily kids who are like history geeks. I have kids who are really focusing on the STEM courses, but they want the class out of the way. Um, and so that, that's one of the reasons why they're taking that kind of a class. Um, for that, that level class, we go all the way back to pre-colonial. So we talk about Native Americans and we talk about the Spanish Inquisition, uh, you know, in, almost invasion. You know, we talk about France, we talk about Britain. And um, then we kind of move into the uh, true American history. Um, you know, and we talk about pre, pre, um, pre-revolution all the way up through till now. I mean, we, we talked at the tail end of the year um, after the AP test, because it was a very strange year. Um, we talked about Obama's um, administration. 
Um, and, and the kids are incredibly interested and they draw connections, but not only between eras of history, but between um, English and history. And like my research paper, they do an independent research paper at the end of every year and it's on science and medicine and the historical implications of what those discoveries are on the modern era. Um, and I've got some of the best papers because they're interested in what, what we're doing. Um, now, I've also taught uh, level one, um, where we start with the Civil War and go up through. Um, and for the most part, other than you know how we evaluate their work, it's the same course. Um, we teach a lot of writing, a lot of communication. Um, so there's, so we also connect with every kid at their level. Um, I've had kids who did um, art portfolios um, as their final final evaluation for a level one class, um, and they, you know, they wrote paragraphs to explain what the they, the picture they drew was about, rather than writing a seven to 10 page paper. And that that's great. You know, I learn as much from those kids every year than I think they learn from me, to be honest. Um, there's also not just the African-American Latinx program. Um, I've had students ask, uh, why don't we have a minorities class? Why don't we have a class on the immigrants that are in Wethersfield? What's their background? What's, how have they contributed? Um, I have, um, well, Mr. Lester knows, um, there was a, uh, a meeting for the educational center that just opened up um, in the historical society. And um, my, this, week, this past weekend, my kids went um, and asked uh, questions and sug made suggestions about what they'd like to see that ties Weathersfield's history into the rest of the country. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say, because I know it's, we're, we're running short on time, is um, that the, the American Studies program at Central, I'm sorry, the American Studies program at UConn is something that Kristen Musinskis and I are um, working on an application for, for the Board of Education. And it is a class that can be either history or English. And under the new humanities program, it's just gonna be a humanities class. And it'll be co-taught and we'll pull in American literature and American history in the 20th century. And we'll really truly be able to integrate um, that as well. So I'm, I'm excited as well as Diana's for, for the possibilities that this gives us as professionals, but also the possibilities for the students um, as well. So that's what I got. <laughs> well, we've Thank been you. talking a lot. I know John has some things to share, but maybe before we go to John, we could open up to questions because I want to make sure that we have the opportunity to answer your questions um, and to give you an opportunity to you know dialogue with us. Um, listening to us talk and share some of the things we have to share. Um, and I think some of the things John has to share might come out of the questions that you might have. Are there any specific questions all of you have or wonderings that you'd like us to talk more about? Yeah, this is this is Rick Newell. Can you hear me? Yeah, Rick, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the previous speaker spoke about it wasn't a big deal if the student failed history. Well, if the, if the student failed history, who do you blame, the student or the person teaching it? Was that for me or for Damien? Well, the, the person that talked before you said it wasn't a big deal if the student failed history. So do you blame the student or do you blame the person teaching it because he didn't pass? I'll take this one. But personally, I would, I would, be, I would blame myself that I think that it is not beyond any one of our students, regardless of their ability, their rate, anything, to understand the basic concepts of any one of the history, history classes. And so if I got my student into, into a position where they were likely to fail, I need to modify and I need to adjust and I need to make a change in the way I teach and not blame them. You know, so... Um, and I, I think that would be true for everyone in our department, is that we modify regardless of whether or not you have a 504 or an IEP or any of the special education paperwork. We're trying to teach kids, not teach history. And so um, when that happens, um, you know, we get to 
the end of the first quarter and we're like, if, if you can't do this, then we either need to make an adjustment to the level you're taking the class at, because maybe it's going too fast, or maybe we're demanding too much um, too quickly, um, or I'm not teaching appropriately for your needs. So I, I mean, the short answer would be, I would blame, I would blame the teacher. And can I thank you, Courtney, for that? Um, and I'll just say this. <laughs> I, no, but what I always look at is when a student fails, we all fail. Student, yeah. teacher, administrator, parents, we all fail. And so how do we come together to help that student? And if I can just add, I, I think what I heard was not that it wasn't a big deal, but that the students were then cycled back in by their counselor's mm -hmm. advice into another program where they could then be successful, I think was what <laughs> I yeah, I think maybe I, I, I was trying to say that and allay the fear that if, if it's no longer required, it's no longer required course and the kid fails. Um, and that was my question to Cindy Bryan. I'm like, how, what, what would, uh, what would our stand be? And again, with this idea of we can't close doors that, she would want them to go back in thinking about their future. Um, so it's not that, that we, you know, that somebody, I mean, certainly sometimes kids are like, I just want to stop doing this, but it's not really that we don't care or the kid doesn't care. It's just the counselor using the relationship that they have with the student, you know, really tries to advise them that going forward, these are going to be important classes and you may not see yourself going to college. You may not see where this information is going to be useful, but don't close that door, you know, because you may find and you may regret thinking that you didn't need this information. So, yeah, I don't, if I gave that impression that somebody didn't care, uh, that's not really what I was trying to express. Thank you. Rick, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, uh, the teacher said I would blame myself because the student was failing. So I, I think that's an honest answer. I, and, and if I was in that situation and if I was teaching a class, say, still in the military, and one of my Marines couldn't get how to put a rifle back together, m myself as the instructor, I would say, like the teacher said, well, I'm failing this person. So the blame comes on me. So yes, she did answer my question. Great, thank you. I saw Frank had his hand up as well with a question. Unmute yourself, Frank. All right, so a question for Courtney. Uh, two parts, uh, you talked about you teach AP courses. And the other part is, I'll just go ahead quickly, is you talk about ECE, and I don't know what that is. So, uh, I mean, what about you the ECE? ECE? So, ECE is Early College Experience, and uh, UConn offers that class. It's one of the largest um, ECE courses um, we offer. It is also, um, UConn offers the largest ECE program in the country. Um, what it means is that for just about 9% of the cost of tuition at UConn, students get UConn credit taught concurrently with their high school history classes. Um, so I, I'm teaching essentially th three kinds of class in one. There's U the Weathersfield's requirement, um, and there's, but there's also the possibility of taking the AP test based on the way I teach it. And then they get the six credits, to both uh, 1501 and 1502 at UConn. Oh, okay, did not know that. Okay, that, that's really very helpful. So as it relates to AP courses, obviously I see the connection. What level students are offered AP courses? Are they juniors and seniors? Well, yes. So everybody who takes U UConn, um, every, well, I'm sorry, everyone who takes US history um, can have the option to take it at the ECE level if they get a couple of requirements done, either a recommendation from their teacher or um, the kids could be waived in. Um, we've had kids take AP classes um, without taking the class. 
itself. Um, we provide uh, review materials. Sometimes it just doesn't happen because of the way the scheduling works. Um, sometimes we don't offer that class and they want to um, do independent study. And so one person would be their independent supervisor and they would do totally a year's worth of research and study. And we would just support them um, in that way for the AP. So relative to what we're discussing, which is uh, I, I, an issue about whether or not there are sufficient history classes with what the Connecticut uh, Education Association is trying to do, there are, in fact, additional history courses, and they are, in fact, AP courses. Is that correct? Yes. I understand that? So, and they are not requirements. They are simply offered. As, They're offered. As right. a right. Yeah, uh, so currently, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, uh, I, I, I get it. I mean, uh, it, it, there's a basic history course for sophomores, and sometimes perhaps for juniors who have uh, 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 language requirements. But mm -hmm. The sophomores who take uh, basic uh, one-on-one history, um, is there a follow-on history course to that that is also offered but not required? Or does it simply jump from sophomores to an AP level? I, I don't no. see that. No, so US history is offered at level one on um, honors and AP. The level one class and the honors class go from just before the Civil War up to the, the current era, the AP class goes from pre-colonial era to the present. But also, um, and it's not a graduation uh, uh, issue, but we have eighth and fifth grade teachers talking about other aspects of history, and we refer to that all the time. And those kids, that my, all of my kids have said, oh, we did this in eighth grade. Like, but but I wanted to teach you now. Like, well, they already did this. You know, and they remember that. Um, you know, the so, fifth so, grade teachers. Okay, well, so, in fact, there are courses available for students who choose to uh, possibly take a career path through history and advanced placement history into yes. uh, yeah. careers. Um, yes, and I've had those kids. And they're working in history. They're working in archaeology. I have one student... Um, uh, his actually his mom is in the hyster historical society who is working as um, an archivist and as a um, anthropologist in the state of Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. So now I, and I say career path because uh, I in the uh, Army Reserve I was an intelligence officer, and I will tell you that history for in the intelligence field, whether it's on the civilian side or whether it's on the uh, military side, is you can't do without it. Uh, you simply cannot function uh, in the military. Doug, you know that, right. uh, without uh, and, history slash intelligence. So yeah. I'm not and seeing I, what the I, problem I, is when those students uh, have those courses available to them. Well, I, I think um, that my students who have joined the military can't tell me what they're doing necessarily. I've had, oh, no, I um, understand that. Yeah, yeah. but um, we, we, sp we spend a fair portion of that talking about just... Um, not warfare necessarily, but we talk about warfare. We talk about the not just the home front issues, but we talk about the strategy and kind of how that has shaped not just American history, but it's shaped the American people. Very um, much and so. Yeah. Very much so. You're right. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about that, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what political party you or your parents belong to. We, you know, we, we kind of remove it from that, and we just talk about you know. How did we get to be who we are? And there's all ways of dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I didn't want to take a military bent to it. I'm just saying that intelligence in its general form relies on history. But yeah. what I'm hearing you from the AP courses and from the ECD courses, that path is available to students who want to take it. Yeah. All right. That's the A answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We I also so. have in the social studies department um, for those kids who like more of the international uh, studies, the, you know, not just U.S. history, we do have an AP modern European. Um, so there are other history offerings for kids. Um, and, and once we get our sequencing, you know, for the freshmen to take the international studies and the sophomores to take U.S., 
it will allow us to be more flexible to offer some of those. But we have, well, you know, the population of, of Wethersfield. And, you know, we have a significant number of kids who are Eastern European and they go into that AP Modern European course. So I would like to see more of those offerings and hopefully in a couple years, that would all be possible. Okay. Thank you. I see I just watching the clock myself. Um, Sandra, do you have a question? I just wanted to make a quick comment in regards to US history no longer being mandatory. However, I have one kid going into her junior year and one kid going to her sophomore year and they both are taking U.S. history and just because that's what you take. Um, it's not so much that they chose it, so it's not mandatory, but they're definitely take, the kids are being put into that class. Nice. Good. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. It's great to have a parent's perspective. Jennifer? Yeah, I just have a comment. I mean, I'm impressed with how comprehensive and integrated uh, history seems to be in, in other courses. And that to me is exciting and stimulating. And, um, you know, I certainly think back to my own um, years in um, high school, which is many, many moons ago, and it was pretty didactic. <laughs> you just, you know, learned this and that was it being able to apply it and and talk it sounds like you're using critical thinking skills um i don't i'm impressed with what you've had to say um i think it's all right i you know i'm not as worried now or concerned that uh, oh good yeah no you've done a great job thank you we're never really satisfied i mean we have these philosophical discussions every you know, maybe once a year or so about what is it that we want to offer? What is it that's important? What is it that the kids want to have? What is it that we think they should have? Um, and so, yeah, we, you know, we, we still could do more integrating, you know, and, and I don't think no, we're, none of us are satisfied. Um, and we are working, we're going to work even more closely with the English department to get true humanities for the, it's so, it's so important when you see kids. I love it when they say to me, you know what? I went to this class and they were talking about the same thing. And I'm like, well, I don't make this stuff up. You know, it exists. <laughs> and, um, and so, but that's a real moment for the kids to see that, you know, we talked about it here and now we're talking about it over here. Yeah. I have this quote on the Weathersfield High School Social Studies Department website. It says that, um, this is the welcome to the class that will explain why all of your other coursework is important now and in the future. All of your classes will explain the context of their specific content. Social studies provides the context for what you see in here for the rest of your life. And so whether you're going to high school or college or graduate school, it doesn't matter. You need the social sciences and you know, you, you need you need a little history in there to understand why things are the way they are now, you know? That's great. I need that at my museum too. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure, I'm sure the math teacher has something up there too about like all all human life is based on mathematic uh, geometry or something. Yeah, it we is. all have our favorite. Um, just in the interest of time, I, I think some of the concerns that I heard last uh, month's meeting were not so much about those college track kids that are in the AP and EC classes, of course, but perhaps the students that might fall through the cracks and not uh, be required to take U.S. history in order to graduate, which I think was what John was going to talk about. And just to Sally help along with that, uh, would, would you like to address that? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, um, so uh, thank you for segueing right into me because those are my students. And so I, I really, uh, I want to pipe into, um, you know, the issue, and first of all, we're not talking about the importance of U.S. history class, but specifically as a graduation requirement. And really, as a advocate for my students, I, I really have to talk about that. And um, so first of all, history really, it helps us develop a better understanding of our nation. It helps us take a sense of pride and patriotism. 
And it really, as one of our goals, helps our students develop their civic mindedness as young adults. So that is not in question at all. Um, but with that being said, I do have concerns on how that can impact you know, some of our students and special ed students. Um, and specifically, as we develop IEPs, um, IEPs, individual education programs, and I will say this probably the only agency worse than the military for acronyms and codes is special ed. We have an acronym code for everything, so I apologize. But with their IEPs, it's so important to look at their individual needs and have the flexibility to design their programs based on these needs. And so I'll just say, we have a wide range of students with many types of disabilities, learning disabilities, including dyslexia, autism, intellectual disabilities, social emotional issues. Um, and the more flexibility we have to develop their programs, the better we can prepare them to meet their individual needs. And so um, we've been doing a lot of work past couple of years and uh, Diane, I think we just ended a group uh, last week um, looking at district training and universal design for learning to better prepare all our students and all our teachers to better prepare our students. And UDL, another acronym there, it, it's really based on research that guides the uh, development of flexible methods, materials, and environments, um, and really minimizes or takes away the barriers of learning, okay? And the best way, um, I'm gonna invite you all to dinner, okay? And so I make a great lasagna. Mr. Lesser, I know you're a vegetarian, so I make meat and lasagna, and so you're gone. Sorry, you might as well not come. Um, Sally, I know you don't like that spicy food, and you know I like that spicy food, so sorry, you're gone. Um, Courtney, um, lactose intolerant, right? So cheese, you're gone. So how do we develop a buffet and a buffet for learning that meets all of your needs? And so um, maybe I'll use another metaphor right now and I'll use a military metaphor because this is actually part of the training. Um, and so um, Todd Rose's book, um, The End of Average, um, he talks about, um, I think it was like the 50s, they found out there was a fatal flaw with aircrafts, that they're building the pilot seat all for one standard average size. And so that's great. I don't know what the average size was, but I'll say 5'9". That's great if you're 5'9". But what happens if you're 5'5 five five or 6'2"? And so they went back because they were getting a lot of crashes, a lot of issues, and they decided that they did not have the money to buy individualized seating for everyone. And so they built standardized seatings within different ranges. And, and so that's really what we're looking to do that we have to make sure that we have choices because uh, US history, again, very important, but I need choices for my students. So if they don't fit that mode, we can still help them succeed, get their diplomas and really have successful adult lives. And so a, a couple metaphors there and sorry to bring a lot of the military with uh, um, acronyms and, uh, uh, airplanes, but I, I think it really helps, you know, me sort of structure the way that I want to make sure every single individual student meets their needs. I do develop it individually. It's on the student and sometimes having very strict, they have to do this, shuts that down. And so I think with the flexibility, we know the importance of all our subjects, but then we can sit down and look at what's important for that individual child. Thank you, John. Uh, questions for John about individual needs? If I could just add on to what John said, I think he's exactly right. But I think from the scheduling perspective, so if we have an eight block period and a student needs um, OT, occupational therapy for one of those blocks, and it's, that student also needs speech support for one of those blocks, and they see a special education teacher for one of those blocks, um, you know, or there might be other services, uh, they might be seeing counseling services for one of those blocks. That limits the number of other academic courses um, that they may be able to fit in their schedule within that, you know, 7.30 to 2.30 day um, because they have to provide other services that some students, you know, wouldn't be getting. And that's where I think the scheduling, if we could make the day three periods longer for them, you know, we could, put all those additional services like OT, PT, speech, counseling, 
um, specific reading strategies, math strategies, but we, in order to find the time in their day, something has to go somewhere. And they again, try the, through the IEP process, really try to build that individualized plan for that student to meet their individual needs, not only in those content areas kind of traditionally as we think, but also to meet their individual special needs. I don't know how our counselors do it because I make it challenging because I throw all these nuances in there, including uh, the classes they're interested in, whether that is history or math or music. Sometimes music's the one that engages our children to be successful. And so we have to make sure we have the flexibility to develop the individual programs. I really thank our council for doing that. If I can maybe ask a question, just to be sure that we all understand, is the fact that US history will not be a graduation requirement, does that free you up then, John, and, and the counselors to then create an IEP that helps a student graduate because there aren't restrictions on what they must and, and must not do in the world of US history? Yeah, absolutely, because then it, we can look at other individual things that they may need, including their uh, related services. So it just provides more flexibility in the same way as the, uh, um, you know, uh, the, um, wow, the pilots, you know, not that, it, so they just have more choices and it provides us mm -hmm. with more choices, if that makes sense. Sure. And, and last month, uh, Ken Lesser went through some of the uh, exemptions to graduation requirements students with disabilities, transfer students coming in as seniors, uh, ESL, so on and so forth. Um, I'm guessing that those exemptions also apply to other subjects in addition to US history. It's not just these are exemptions to US history, these are exemptions to all graduation requirements in order to navigate that student successfully through the educational requirements at diploma. Is that correct understanding? Absolutely, and I, I do have to point out though, based on the disability, like we can't just do it like randomly, like ah, okay, whatever. It really has to be based on their disability um, with data that we have to demonstrate that. Great. Yeah, and thank really, you so much. And I really think that that's really the exception to the rule. Um, I think Sandra said it best. It's not required, but it really is required, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's really what she said. It's not required in our policy, but yet through school counselors, through teachers, through the philosophy of the school, we're requiring you to take US history, but there's those exceptions to that kind of, that's get again, because that's the only class that sophomores are gonna be able to take. Um, we expect when they go to register, that's the only course they're gonna be able to select. Um, but then again, as John talked about the exception, and you know, I say maybe 2%, um, again, small number of students, but, Sandra said it, it really is it's not required but it is required. Gotcha and I, I guess if I understand correctly the new requirements really pertain to the class of 2023 2024 going forward so you don't really have data on how many students under the new regime will not will, will graduate without U.S. history. Is that correct. correct? Yeah yeah but we'd be happy to come back in a few years and talk about that once we have some trends. If you'd like to invite us back, I'm sure we'll have some good news to share. Well, on a personal basis, I would love to talk with each of you much longer because I find this fascinating. And I think a lot of the commissioners here as well do as well, whether they're parents or, or you know, I think everybody goes through public school, they think they're an expert on education, but you guys are really the experts on education and, and we definitely appreciate that. Um, are there other questions from members of the commission? Hearing none. Okay. Wow. Well, you've given us an education. I, I will say I really do appreciate uh, you taking the time at what I know is a really busy time of year for you. The end of the school year is, is, is coming up very fast. And uh, uh, that's not uh, something that we take for granted. So Sally and all of you, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight and uh, very, very helpful to the commission's understanding. And just as residents of w uh, Wethersfield, sorry, I almost said Windsor, my other town, um, <laughs> that uh, I know bad, right? um, uh, really helpful to us uh, to, to understand that. 
And so I think um, we have a few other agenda items that we're going to fairly quickly go through. I don't want you to feel like you need to stay on, but if you'd like to, you're welcome to just for the sheer joy of hearing us talk about some of the things that we're doing. But if you drop off, we won't be offended. And, and you have our sincere thanks for your time tonight. Great. Thank, thank you, you for so inviting us. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank and you. we uh, thank, thank you for the partnership and we look forward to some continued partnerships. So have a great night. Absolutely. Bye. Yeah. See you next I'll year. thank you because talking about dinner, I'm hungry and I need some dinner. So have a good <laughs> night. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Well, that was pretty cool, huh? Um, we, we do have a few more agenda items. I don't think they need to take a lot of time. Um, just before we move on to the other agenda items, are there any other comments about what you just heard? Wow. That was interesting. Wonderful information. That was, I had no idea that there was a story behind the story. Yeah. I was very impressed with the presentation. Yeah. They were very thorough. Again, I mean, it just seemed um, so much more exciting to me than I've ever experienced in school. So. Really ramped up. Uh, uh, as, a, as a side note, as a, as a citizen and retired uh, reserve officer of the county, not as a part of the uh, Veterans Commission, I'm going to offer to, um, uh, to Sally, Courtney, and Diane, possibly for the next year, uh, a guest speaker opportunity for them, talking about uh, my experience in Bosnia, which was a conflict, it wasn't a war, but when I got sent over there, and I had done all of my military intelligence in the um, either in Germany during that time and then, of course, in the, uh, in the, in the Middle East. But when I got sent to, uh, to Bosnia, the first thing that they taught us was the Battle of Kosovo, mid-June 1389. And I will give you a long story, but if you didn't understand what happened 630 years ago, you couldn't understand the conflict back in the late 90s when I was over. So uh, that's what I'm going to offer them. And uh, with all the the caveats of it's unclassified. Uh, they would approve my presentation. It's for the AP course. But I find that to be absolutely, especially with uh, they have uh, um, um, Balkan based you know, uh, uh, immigrants who have, who have become Americanized. Uh, I think this is a wonderful story about the history of 1389 and how it affected when uh, Joseph Ross, aka Tito, uh, um, died. And what created that then? So, and then how even today, because my wife was teaching kids who emigrated from Bosnia back in the late nineties, and how they integrated so well into our Weatherfield society, because there's a large number of, of uh, Bosnians and uh, uh, Albanians in the, in the town. Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm going to offer them. But again, I will not do it as a member of the uh, Veterans Commission. I will do it as a private citizen. Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, sorry, there's a little bit back there. Um, in terms of John Sands' request to us uh, that we consider this, I think we owe John a response. Uh, so um, I'm interested in hearing what members of the commission feel would be an appropriate response. Anybody? <laughs> I, think I, I think they had a lot of great stuff to say. And I do think that there's a lot of cool stuff offered. But I just was confused a little bit. And it could be me, operator error here. But not required, but required. And I know that they're offering it sophomore year. And, they're, and I still think it's a requirement for college. I understand that. But there are going to be kids, and not special needs kids, that are going to say, oh, I'm not going to college. And I know that the counselors are going to encourage them to take it because they really don't know. But that doesn't mean they're going to take it. And it's mm -hmm. just not the special needs kids, I, 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 my concern is. Um, 
so I guess maybe I was at last meeting it was spoke about. So what I'm understanding that US history is a required high school course if you're on the college path, but it's not required to graduate from Weathersville High School. Correct? That's the bottom line. Right. Okay. And that, is that, that it was, that way in opinion. others in other towns as well? Or is that a Weathersfield thing or is it a state thing? I don't know. Um, you know it's it it's a Weathersfield thing. Um, yeah. The state did relax their requirements on various things in order to give the towns more latitude in planning their curriculum. Uh, my, I did speak with the state social studies coordinator about this um, several weeks ago, and he said their expectation was that most towns would continue to require U.S. history, um, and he said his observation is that most are continuing to require U.S. history. They relaxed the standards at the state level, not so that towns would relax their standards, but so that towns could have more latitude because they had asked for that latitude in planning their curriculum. So there's a little bit of a, you know, state town kind of a thing. Weathersfield took a different tack, I think, than most towns did. Uh, I know here in the town of Windsor, where I work, uh, they are continuing to require U.S. history as a graduation requirement. Thank you. I just wasn't sure if it was something I missed, but I personally think it should be continued as a requirement. That's, I can go to a board meeting for that if I choose, but that's just my opinion. Sandra, it looks like you have your hand up. Did you want to say something? I do. I just wanted to say that while the U.S. history is not required, the reason why they say, but it's still a requirement when the kids go to sign up for class, they have to choose US history. They cannot choose not to take it. You really have to go into the guidance counselor and get an exception. So when she's saying 98% of the kids are taking US history, even though it's not a graduation requirement, they're required but not required because they can't choose not to take it. So I don't know if that helps anybody, but neither of my kids, they had to click on it. Mine want to take U.S. history, but they have, they still have to. Yeah, that's helpful to understand, Sandra. I, I wonder if maybe our approach might be to actually to ask them to come back, you know, next year uh, or some time after that and, and tell us how many students actually are taking U.S. history versus are not, you know, to, to see is it, is it having the effect they thought it would or is it, you know, as you've suggested, Laura, maybe it's a, a wider range of kids are not taking U.S. history because they're not required to. Um, but I don't think they really know quite yet because the requirements are just being applied and it hasn't really applied to this next couple graduating classes. Does that seem okay? Yes, I see. Some I would, good uh, I would uh, second whatever you just said, Doug. I would <laughs> be for them coming back next year. Okay. Just keep in mind that next year's numbers will be elevated because they are having both the junior and the sophomore classes take it because this this year's sophomores they're was not that US history choice because it's just taking effect. So I just wanted to state that from a statistics pers perspective. Yeah, thank you. It's actually the uh, graduating class of 2023 for which this new requirement yes. is in place. So they're kind of in transition, I think. Yes. So it might be more relevant to invite them back in two years if any of us are still here <laughs> to look at that. That's true. But I mean, yeah. we could get an idea next year, how many of the sophomores and how many of the juniors are exempt or did not take that course. That might be a good determination at that point. Right, right. 
Doug, as yeah. far as Mr. Sand goes, I kind of wish he attended this meeting because I think it would have given him a lot more insight. Um, but I wouldn't mind getting together with him to discuss kind of what this meeting was all about, or I can provide him with my notes. I did take a ton of notes about what everybody said, and I thought it was very well done. I agree with Jennifer. You know, I had no idea all of this was going on and how they were handling it. It doesn't seem like they're not requiring it. Um, I don't think Mr. Sand kind of got that, you know, initially. So I wouldn't mind reaching out to him. I could email him. I could get together with him. I can handle that. If you need me to do so, I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, if everybody else is comfortable with that, I certainly am. Yeah. That's fine. I'm comfortable. Yeah. Thank you, Helen. That's very nice of you. Um, I will say that, um, when uh, I think it was Diana Adamson started her talk and she says, oh, I'm feeling really old. I think it must have been because she saw you as a panelist and you must have been one of her students uh, a little while ago. I also had Mrs. Bradley, so that was interesting too. I was like, oh man, all my teachers on here. <laughs> Great. Uh, kudos to you. If, if, if all of the students from Wethersfield High School come out as good as you do, then they're doing a great job as teachers, that's for sure. I'm impressed um, by them. I was very impressed by how they are trying to accommodate everything and, and looking at the big picture. I, I thought that was kind of new compared to what I went through, which was not that long ago, you know? Sure. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a tough job. Uh, I think the public schools have so much thrust on them. Um, many different ways. We could spend hours talking about public education, but we probably can't tonight. Um, why don't we move on? Thank you. So Helen, just to recap, Helen's going to talk to Mr. Sand about it, and we'll invite them to come back again in the future and talk to us about um, what they really see happening in terms of students with U.S. history. And it's not off our radar screen, uh, but we're not going to uh, go stand at the Board of Ed right now and protest or anything like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Although Frank wants to, I can see that, but um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, implementation plan update. We just put that on the agenda as a quick check-in. Um, while this is the last meeting of this uh, year, the next meeting is in September. We are looking at uh, Frank, a fall newsletter. So um, I would just ask if you have, anyone has ideas for the fall newsletter content to send that to Frank and to Jennifer Glick, uh, who will be, I assume, will you both continue as the uh, editor and, and team uh, for the newsletter? Uh, very much so. I think, uh, Jennifer, we're, you know, we have a good we have a good thing going in terms of uh, our different perspectives on things. Uh, I personally would like to see it out for the period right around uh, Veterans Day, which yeah, gives yeah, us two yeah. months. And I think that, uh, I think that knowing what we know, the past first one that we should be able to do that my only question is budget um how much do we wind up spending for the uh first or uh well uh, we look at that right now as mary has given us a nice budget report from the packet do you want to speak to that mary how much we spent on the first newsletter sorry i i didn't hear your question how much did we spend on the first newsletter did i, uh, did I put the budget in the packet yep yep it's in here so, so that's all we spent i, so I the, at home i apologize I did not print it out for myself so we only really had to pay for the mailing labels and the uh postage so it looked like 547 dollars were spent leaving us with 1122 dollars um so we have plenty of money for another uh, newsletter going into next year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just to clarify. Great. Frank, thank you. And I, I listed Facebook posts on here. Uh, just, I, I frankly can't remember where we are on Facebook. Do we have a way to get things into Facebook? Um, I, I, I will hound the one person IT department, I promise. I've been trying to um, uh, not bother him, and we still are two people short. And um, I will ask him about what the town's policies are and whether other commissions have Facebook pages or how they approach using social media 
and if there are any town guidelines uh, that need to be done or if groups do it privately or if they're not allowed. I will get that info and I promise you, uh, well, if you'd like, I can uh, do an email to the commission because we're not meeting till September. So I can find right. that information out and just like email it to you so that you have like a little bit of an open okay. for the summer. That would be awesome. Thank you. Because I think we could probably get a couple of volunteers. I know Tricia sounded interested uh, in helping with that, but it'd be great to get a couple of people that could, you know, work on Facebook posts on a periodic basis and um, whether it's to the town site or a different one, I think it would be helpful to that age bracket of veterans that do use Facebook. Okay. Okay. So um, moving on to Memorial Day, uh, many of you were present. Uh, several of you were part of the committee that helped put it together. And I just want to say before we get into any kind of a recap, thank you to Mary, uh, because Mary, as uh, you know, many people wondered when Sal retired, oh my God, who's going to fill his big shoes? And uh, Mary made it look pretty easy. Uh, so uh, congratulations. It was really a great ceremony. Even though we shifted indoors, uh, everything went uh, really, really smoothly. Many of you, Rick, uh, had big speaking roles uh, in that as well, which uh, went very nicely as well. So uh, any thoughts, any comments recap wise about that? Rick, did you want to say anything? Oh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for uh, <clears throat> being here and contributing. And uh, a message to my friend Jennifer, I am redoing that uh, poem that I gave you and I am adding two names to it, and one of them is yours. As soon as I revise it, I will send you copies of it. And then, okay. um, we had a great turnout, we, which was very lucky, considering it was a very last-minute pivot due to the weather. Um, and uh, I, I, thought, I thought it was very nice. I thought the... Uh, the crowd was very respectful. The um, speakers were very good. I thought Ryan did a phenomenal job. Uh, he shared information about the coins on the headstone that I had no idea. It brings me to tears. Um, it, it was just, it was very moving. It went way longer than I thought it was going to for a short ceremony. We went longer than we typically do. I don't know if that's a bad thing uh, because it, it was really nice. Um, Anyway, I was happy with the way it turned out, and I thank everybody for their input uh, to to help and and you know everything you guys do to to make it successful. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. You know, I think given that there was no parade, I think nobody really minded spending an hour and a half at the ceremony uh, because they weren't spending you know an hour at a parade or or whatever and the ceremony. So. It was really nice. I think if, if it was at the graveside, uh, we probably wouldn't want to spend 90 minutes out in the hot sun or whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, other any other comments about the Memorial Day? Oh, I, I just want to tell everybody, after uh, we had the ceremonies at the uh, center, I went back and took the reefs away from the monuments. I put them in my garage because of the weather until Tuesday. And I replaced them back out there on, uh, I'm sorry, on Monday for the actual holiday. Are you sure you didn't just put them at your yard, Rick, with all those nice no, I, silhouettes? I, I, did, <laughs> I did one when the guy, I'm going to tell you what happened. Sunday when he came over to set that thing up, I had one in the garage and I said, well, if I'm going to, the guy that set my display up took all those pictures. So I put that, I put that out there just for that, that, uh, Thing with the signs but they were they i did return them to where they went in fact i picked up one uh i think wednesday i went wednesday or tuesday afternoon i went and got the one that was left at the senior center and brought it back to bonetti's florist great no i was just i was just kidding your your lawn display oh. looked looked beautiful that actually, that same display is at our department headquarters on uh, our new department. Good. Good. Okay. Well, if, if nothing else on Memorial Day, we'll move along just to uh, finish up 
Um, in terms of acknowledging service, I, I think it's really just on there in case there are any people whose service we should acknowledge, be they either veterans or people who serve veterans. Are there any that we should mention? No. I will say just to put it in our, our thinking for the Veterans Day ceremony, um, I'm going to suggest that we present a certificate of appreciation to Johnson Brunetti uh, and, and Chris Taylor knows who they are. They're the ones that for two years in a row have sponsored the um, uh, veterans uh, home repairs through the uh, blanking out on the, the name Homes of the for heroes. Homes for heroes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, they have paid $5,000, I think each year to support that and uh, I think that's service to our town's veterans that deserves recognition. So maybe we could present them with a, uh, a certificate at the veteran ceremony next year. So we can make the veteran ceremony an hour and a half as well by adding lots of agenda items. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay. Uh, update on support group for families. Several of you were going to help um, and, and I don't have the notes in front of me. We're going to help the woman whose name is escaping me uh, set up a veteran support group. Chris, I think you were helping her and several others had yep. offered to. Yep, I, I do have a little bit of an update. I, I did speak to Andrea the other day and she said she is reaching out to the Connecticut Family Assistance Agency, which is under the state VA for support services. Um, so she informed me that she will provide more of an update for the next meeting because she's working with that agency, the Connecticut Family Assistance Agency. Oh, good. Good. So that's, well, thank that's you. All I have to do. Yep. Thank you for helping her. And, you know, she's welcome to come back anytime and share information or ask for help if she needs it. Um, yep. I, I, have... I will let her know that. Thank you. I do be good for the next newsletter. I'm sorry, I do invite her to the meeting. She's Thank included you. in the Zoom distribution in case she has anything she wants to share. I'm sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. No, I was just saying that, you know, hopefully by the fall, that'll be a newsletter item. Good. Yeah. Um, Chris, since you're already sharing information, do you have anything you'd like to share about um, town staff serving veterans needs, which a lot of that is through um, you? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know it's been a busy month this month. You know, we continue to help veterans when they call in about their needs. And uh, we had one call from a caregiver. Um, her husband is a veteran and uh, a lot of questions about home care and um, and specific needs of his. And uh, so I did spend quite a bit of time with her and uh, hopefully, you know, he is getting the help that he needs. But a lot of times people call and they don't, they're not the veterans are not registered with the federal VA health care system. So that's that's um you know an area that I spend quite a bit of time explaining, you know, how to you know how one uh connects with the federal VA and, and gets in into the health care system and needs to get that card and so you know that was one um call that I got this month. And also veterans are still coming in for food needs. Um, so we try to help them with that and, uh, you know, for emotional needs that they have and also for the renter's rebate program, quite a few veterans have signed up for that. So we've been busy this month and that's a good thing. Uh, good and bad, right? It's unfortunate that there's so much need, but it's great that you're there uh, to interface with them on that. Are, are there things, Chris, that members of the commission can be helpful with? Well, as I mentioned, maybe, you know, I know Jennifer was mentioning that too is uh, an item for the newsletter, maybe to say, how do you, you know, as a veteran, how can you get into the healthcare system? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of our veterans from, from years, I find that, you know, I get calls and it's usually like an, a crisis or an emergency situation from a family member and the veteran is not feeling well and um you know needs needs more help at home or may need to go into a va um hospital you know in rocky hill uh for further rehab perhaps and uh but has not signed up for the va health care card you know so 
that might be an item to like a question and answer how, you know, um, to make the veterans aware that that is a program available to them. Yeah, that's a great idea. It's uh, it's hard enough. So can I can I add something to Chris's uh, report? Please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, sir. This Friday, actually, we're having our Disabled Americans Veterans Convention at the uh, the Marriott in Cranwell, and from nine to twelve, my NSOs, my National Service Officers, will be giving a service officer seminar. It's open to the public. So if anybody, if you want to put that on the website and, and to let people in town know, but my guys will be there from 9 to 12 doing a seminar, basically like uh, we did one a couple of years ago, I think, in, at the senior center. And there will be information, basically how to get to do all that stuff. That's great. That's great, Rick. Thank you. And probably... Uh, after we're done with all this COVID, I'm, I'm going to try and whenever we can reopen the center, uh, I'll, I'll see if maybe in the fall we can do another uh, seminar in the fall too. Because we we now we used to do uh, we used to have vans and we'd go around to certain towns and and do, and hook up to uh, either a Walmart or whatever and do claims. But it's just so much easier to go to uh, a town hall or. Uh, a senior center to give the, to do claims and to give these seminars. That sounds great. And um, can you give me that date again? When when the it's, convention is this Friday? Is this coming oh, this Friday? Friday coming. Yeah. Okay. And it'll be it's from nine to twelve at the Marriott and Crownwell, and that's uh, there'll be a lot of DAV people there because we're, we're starting our convention on Thursday, and we have a national officer coming in for a ribbon cutting ceremony on on uh, at our new department on Friday. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. All right. Great. Thank you both. So we've got um, just a couple of quick minutes left. Um, Mary, I think we've covered the budget. We don't need to uh, talk about that uh, any further. Um, the last agenda item is board member comments. Um, this is an opportunity for anything you didn't have a chance to say during the course of the meeting. Okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, just to say, this is our last meeting of the year and I do wanna thank all of you for your continued service to the town and to the town's veterans. It's vitally important. And I think we've had a really good productive year, both this commission and the, the two committees uh, that put on the Veterans Day ceremony and the Memorial Day ceremony. We're kind of looking forward to next year and getting out of, as Rick said, getting out of the COVID uh, and, and back to more in person. So uh, Mary's been getting us set up. Uh, our meeting dates are on the um, roster for the first part of next year. So please make sure that you're on your calendar. Uh, our next meeting will be Wednesday, September 8th at six o'clock. Um, we are currently planning for that to be an in-person meeting unless we hear otherwise. Um, and our meetings will move. Uh, we'll start meeting at the uh, fireside room at the Pitkin Community Center. Uh, we're doing that for several reasons. One is that it's a bigger room and the meeting spaces at Town Hall are, are really cramped for the size of our committee and any guests that might come. Um, and the Pitkin Community Center is where the senior center is and where some of our veterans congregate on a regular basis. So it kind of is a more natural place for us to be. Um, so we'll make sure you get an announcement prior to that meeting. Um, just because we're not meeting over the summer doesn't mean we don't have things to do. I know the newsletter team will be working and, and I'll stay in touch with Mary and others. Um, and just wanted to say if, if you see the roster and there's a missing phone number or an out of date phone number or email, please let Mary know that so she can update the roster. It's really important that we have a good way of communicating with everybody. Um, so unless there are any other comments, Mary, anything that you want to pass on to everybody? It came in my brain and now it's gone. Um, I honestly, I could. Well, there's it's always gone. So if, I, if it was really important, I'll email everybody. How's that? I was just going to say, there's always email. 
and we should stay in touch over the summer. I look forward to seeing you all in person at our next meeting. Now, Mary remembered. Now I remember. We're talking about the Pitkin Community Center and the Senior Center being there. And also there was a discussion of having a, uh, a bulletin board to kind of be the uh, Veterans Resource Center for anything they wanted. So they have chosen one. It's out of outside of Channel 14, so it's halfway down the hall between the community center office and the um, senior center offices, which are like down the very end. So I know that's been set aside. I know it's ready to go. Uh, the seniors are planning on, right now they're doing only one-on-one -on -one things, but they are gonna slowly be bringing back senior groups um, this summer and launching right. numbers and then maybe trying to be even more productive starting in September. So that was, that was it. That was my community center update, adding on to our meetings uh, being there starting in September. Super, Mary, thank you. And, and that's my subcommittee. So I will um, follow up with you on that. And if we can start populating that bulletin board, I think that's, that's good. So awesome. Well, folks, thank you all very much. It's 7.30, oops, 7.32. We will adjourn for today and see you all next fall. Have a wonderful summer. You too. you too. Thank you. Have a good summer. Take care.